it is a pleasure to be here. Uh, very grateful that uh, we are able to bring uh, the message to all our brothers and sisters around the world, as I understand that this is uh, broadcast um, everywhere. Uh, I must uh, indicate before I start that uh, I am a social scientist, I'm a historian, and that's my uh, job, and uh, I specialize in the U.S. foreign policy, particularly in Latin America. And uh, I've been uh, actually, uh, I think, in most of the, uh, I will say, everywhere in Latin America except Paraguay. I haven't been there yet. Uh, probably next year I might be there. And uh, I can, uh, I will probably bring you on the aspect of our, uh, I'm saying our involvement because I am in the United States of America. I made it. <laughs> and I will probably uh, touch that area because I've been talking to a lot of people these days, everywhere. Uh, I just came uh, from another presentation in the East Coast, and uh, and I think it's, it's what is very key is to understand and put it into the context the, uh, of uh, U.S. foreign policy in the region, what uh, just happened in Bolivia, and not just Bolivia. Uh, what is taking place in Chile, uh, what is taking place in Ecuador, even Peru, as this moment is, is, a, is a government-less country. There is no government in Peru. And uh, Colombia right now is paralyzed, uh, so is Chile. And uh, so I, I, would suggest, I would suggest that you, um, when you look at this issue, just done uh, try to look at just one piece because uh, it's not what the U.S. foreign policy is in the region. They see it as a whole. They see the whole region and this is part of a program. This is uh, what just happened in uh, Bolivia, that coup, uh, golpe the Estado was the, that they call, it's, it's, just, uh, it's not just Bolivia. It's, uh, and, and not only that, but uh, it is being happening. Uh, I got to tell you that uh, I, I, I have been in, uh, in Bolivia prior to Evo Morales. I have been in Bolivia during Evo Morales. And I have been in Bolivia after Evo Morales. And I got to tell you that uh, ever since 2005, by the way, uh, you have to understand that uh, Bolivia has been uh, seen uh, through the eyes of the U.S. foreign policy makers as a, as, a, as a piece of land full of resources that the U.S. need. That's it. That's how they see it. And uh, that's why I stated earlier that you really have to uh, look at uh, the uh, historical processes that are taking place, that have taken place, in order to understand what's going on right now. Because uh, just to give you a, a little, um, uh, another number, between, two, between 1999 and 2005, Bolivia had six presidents. So if you, can, if you can do your own math, uh, including one that wasn't even a Bolivian. He's a U.S. citizen and couldn't even speak Spanish. <laughs> Needless to say, one of the 26 and more uh, languages that, are, uh, that, that uh, the people of Bolivia speak. So that tells you that, uh, uh, you know, we go back to the 1823, right? James Monroe, the uh, Monroe Doctrine. Uh, America, uh, not for the Americans, America for the elites, because it's not even for the Americans. I mean, the, North, the, the American people right now, as the brother said earlier, and locally in San Francisco uh, are suffering. The, the, the people in the United States uh, really, really are going through dark times. And, uh, and we probably will touch upon um, later because I also represent, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a union uh, uh, person. I belong to the American Federation of Teachers. And, uh, and, and, and I can tell you 
that uh, not just in San Francisco, but uh, throughout the whole uh, country. The last number, so that you have an idea, is that professors all over the US, close to 70% are part-timers. So can you imagine? Can you imagine how our students will learn when the person who is teaching them is working 10, 15 hours, 20 hours the most? So that, a little parenthesis. So going back to uh, uh, Bolivia, and, and, and I will have to add another element, as I was saying earlier, from uh, 1999 right to 2005, because in 2005, Evo Morales, by the way, the first Native American elected in the whole history of the continent. I'm saying Native American because I'm, I'm talking about America. I'm not saying uh, Native Bolivian. Uh, he, is, uh, he belongs to the ethnic group called uh, uh, the Aymaras. Aymaras. And look, uh, 2005, he gets elected with more than 65% of the vote. First time ever in the history of Bolivia in that case, because ever since the 1820s, what Bolivia had was European descended leaders. And that's why 2005, that's why everybody say there is a Bolivia before 2005, and there is a Bolivia after 2005. And uh, I got to tell you that uh, right after Evo Morales was elected, immediately, immediately, the United States of America, through the uh, Central Intelligence Agency and through the National Endowment for Democracy and some other uh, intelligence organizations, they uh, got ready and uh, through, through the State Department and the U.S. Embassy started the process of getting rid of Evo Morales. So 2019, um, one can look at it and, uh, and you can see uh, how long did it, did it take them to uh, finally uh, destroy that historical project. But which, by the way, and we'll, we'll, we'll touch upon that later. Uh, as of this moment, last Saturday, I had a conversation uh, directly with some of the leaders of the MA. Is mass. That is the political party that uh, Evo Morales actually uh, uh, founded with uh, so many other uh, leaders. And MAS uh, in Spanish is Movimiento Hacia el Socialismo. In English, will be a movement towards socialism. And uh, first time ever in the history of that country that they are starting to talk about uh, their own situation in those terms. So here you have the first, uh, as the elite of Bolivia call him, el indio, you know, the Indian. Uh, uh, you get him elected, and then in the next elections, he got reelected. And then in the next elections, he got reelected again. And what happened is that, and some of you uh, probably will remember that term that uh, was used that one of the poorest countries in the Western Hemisphere was Bolivia and Haiti. So whenever you talk about uh, hey, what are the poorest countries in the uh, Western Hemisphere? Oh, Haiti and Bolivia. So that was, in the case of uh, Bolivia, that was before, that was true, before 2005. Well, guess what? Guess what happened? In less than 20 years, and please don't, uh, don't take my word, uh, go ahead and look at the uh, report from the United Nations. Look at the report from the uh, World Bank. And there you will find that there is one country in Latin America which in the last 10 years, year after year consecutively, has had positive economic growth. 
and what they call it is uh, uh, progreso económico y social, social and economic uh, progress. It's not as, you know, we say, oh, wow, macroeconomics. Uh, oh, okay, so we are doing good because we are dealing with uh, the finances very well, but then guess what? The people are not doing good. And Bolivia is the other way around. Uh, poverty was brought down more than 40%. I mean, even the IMF, uh, International Monetary Fund, had, had been saying about Bolivia that they had been doing a really great job in, in the last few years, as uh, the data indicates so. And uh, not only that, but uh, under the administration of the MAS, MAS with uh, Evo Morales, uh, the, in, in many areas, I, I'll just uh, mention a few that uh, I, I have witnessed. Uh, for instance, the elderly in, uh, in Bolivia. In the last uh, 10, 15 years, they had an increase in their pensions. Schools, the school, just to give you a number, right? And probably you already know that uh, the United Nations uh, they put a, a, a minimum percentage that every country must put into education from their budget, which is 6%. So 6% of their budget must at least go to education. Well, guess what? Bolivia is leading Latin America in terms of how much they were putting into education. Uh, if you look at it ever since uh, probably 2007 until last year, it will be anywhere between 15 to 22 percent, something that uh, even in the European, Nordic European countries, is, you hardly see that. So that is what uh, those numbers, those numbers, and I want you to uh, uh, remember these numbers because later on when I'm going to tell you about what happened last Saturday, uh, then you uh, will probably understand where is this going to go because next, in the next few weeks there will be elections in Bolivia. So these numbers, what these numbers reflect is that the entire society and uh, remember I told you Bolivia is, was at the bottom of the countries in terms of poverty. And, uh, and now is up there, top number one in terms of economic development, in terms of uh, helping their people, in terms of health, in terms of education, uh, even um, uh, the unemployment uh, numbers. Uh, plummeted in the last 10 years as a result of the uh, policies that the government has implemented. Almost everybody's working over there in decent jobs. So, it, and, and I want to also, uh, as I was uh, telling uh, uh, our friends uh, uh, yesterday, uh, that one needs to understand what's going on also around. Uh, uh, in, in the continent, in South America. And I will give you uh, a couple of quick examples. Um, I compare, because a lot of people were saying, right, oh my God, okay, so, you know, the, the time of the era of coups is over, you know, democracy now and uh, you know, respect uh, human rights and everything and the U.S. foreign policy finally is not about overturning governments. And, uh, and, and well, he, he, here we are. I mean, that's not, uh, that's not the case at all. Uh, the U.S. Uh, foreign policy, if they have to do another coup tomorrow, they will do it. They will do it. And uh, I, I think you remember, uh, some of you, or most of you might, rem might, might remember about uh, 1954. In 1954 in Guatemala with uh, Jacobo R. Banks. You know, we were analyzing. Yesterday, I uh, put some audios that I have in my uh, in my library, and uh, I was sharing them with uh, some of the uh, our friends. And there is Jacobo R. Banks uh, forced to resign, uh, 1954, forced to resign by who? By the same people who forced Evo Morales to resign. How many years later? So, 
That, that's why I say, if you're looking, uh, if you're going to take a look at uh, uh, Bolivia, uh, you might not just stop there because everything, everything is well planned. We have some uh, uh, audios. Uh, we got some information from some uh, Bolivians in which they uh, gave us actually uh, some uh, some people got in, uh, in the meeting and there were some uh, recordings. And the name of three senators came up. And uh, probably you might, you might, you might, you might guess who, who, who the names were. I'll just give you the uh, state where they come from: Texas, <laughs> New Jersey, and, and Florida. Okay, so names are clear: Ted Cruz, right? Marco Rubio, and Bob Menendez. And then you, and then you are like, wait a minute. These guys are all Hispanics. Mm. They're all Latinos. Little Marco Rubio, you know, he's uh, uh, what they call a gusano. You mean from Cuba? From Cuba. <laughs> little, little Ted. Uh, even, even. Uh, <laughs> where, but you know what? Uh, that, I'm, I'm glad that you bring that up because even Mr. 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 Trump, by accident, I don't know if it was by accident, but he brought up something that is true, actually, historically. Ted Cruz's dad was a mafia guy. And he was involved. And guess what? He was involved in the Kennedy assassination. That little senator from Texas. And then, of course, the ultra-right wing, Bob Menendez. But then people say, wait a minute, but Bob Menendez, uh, you know, he's, uh, he's not a Republican. And then you go like, wait a minute, what, who told you that there is a difference, right, between the uh, Republicans and the Democrats when, when we are going to be talking about foreign policy? That is not, not, not different. And, uh, and, and, and then that, that's where you realize it and you say, oh, I see, because, you know, it's the same bird with the two wings, right? So it's the same thing. So as, as it is now, because uh, I, I see the, the, the signal here, uh, the, we're running out of time, but I just gotta. I I want you to, uh, and you know, uh, I always say this, right? Because a lot of people say, well, you know, uh, how 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 you got all that information? And, uh, well, I am probably I don't know. Maybe I'm fortunate. I am fortunate to. Uh, this is my job. I'm a social scientist. I do 24/7 research. That's what I do. And, uh, and whenever I uh, have the time and the opportunity, uh, I really like to go and see with my own eyes. Like in Venezuela. Venezuela. Little, uh, little guy here called, uh, whose name is uh, Jorge Ramos. Hmm. Anybody know Mr. Jorge Ramos? You know, he's uh, Uni Univision, the Univision uh, uh, the equivalent to uh, this guy on CNN. Uh, anybody knows that name of this guy? That uh, Andrew, Anderson Cooper. <laughs> Anderson Cooper. And it's amazing. It's like they were made with the same whatever model because uh, they they look alike. And uh, and I sent a report uh, because Jorge Ramos <laughs> went to Venezuela to think that he was going to humiliate the president. And the president, Nicolás Maduro, was kind enough to let this journalist, the number one, right, number one journalist in the Hispanic world, journalist, <coughs> yes. Yeah, uh, Jorge Ramos, that's what they call him, right? So he was sent, later on we found out that he was working uh, with, um, uh, what's the um, uh, Mike Pompeo? So we knew later on that Mike Pompeo had sent him. So I sent a letter to to Univision because I'm like, wait a minute, hey, are you supposed? To, are you a journalist? 
Uh, why? Because, you know, he made a mistake. Um, he made a mistake once in Caracas when he was in uh, Venezuela. And, and, and remember, I'm bringing this up because I don't want you to just look at Bolivia as an isolated case. Because that will be a... Uh, not a mistake, but uh, you, you know, it, it, there wouldn't be an understanding, a profound understanding of what we really are doing over there. So we send Jorge Ramos to provoke Nicolas Maduro, and uh, and and uh, finally Nicolas Maduro said, "Well, look, you know, you are like the CIA. Are you a journalist or you're a CIA person?" So finally, not to uh, take too much time on this, he said, "Okay, look, you know what? This is over, my friend." This is not an interview. You came here to question me. And then later on, we, uh, we learned that um, uh, Mike Pence and uh, Pompeo uh, was working with him and had indicated to him, I told him to go over there and do exactly what he did. Uh, the, uh, as you know, I think you, you're following this very deep. Uh, ever since 1999, we have sent teams to Venezuela, uh, meaning, you know, what, what is called uh, uh, mercenaries, right? They are inside Venezuela. And you remember in 2002 that we went over there and did a coup. We kidnapped the then president, Hugo Chavez. We took him. And uh, he, uh, Evo Morales say, okay, I'm resigning, right? He was forced. Hugo Chavez was also forced, but he say, I'm not, I'm not gonna do that. So they took him to the island, to an island. And see what happened is that, and this is, I'm gonna go back to Bolivia in a few minutes, but uh, I just wanna let you know that what happens is that this way of popular government I mean popular meaning that they come really from the people. They organize their own citizens. And what happened with Hugo Chavez was that not even 24 hours had passed that uh, we kidnapped uh, him when uh, there were about more than a million Venezuelans right there in, in, in Caracas asking for the return of their president. And they didn't have any other choice. They didn't have any other choice because by then you could felt that Venezuela was going to probably put in a, in a situation that probably nobody would have been able to control it. So at the end, they said, oh shoot, what are we gonna do? So they brought him back, 2002, three, four, five, they kept trying after they failed to do the coup and kidnapped him. Then they went into the uh, special operations that they have now, special units on assassination. And you know, he's no longer with us, right? Because what? He was poisoned and he suffered a lot. So, so he died. But then uh, Nicolás Maduro, Nicolás Maduro took over. He was elected, elected and re-elected. And our former president here, right, in the 70s, Mr. Jimmy Carter and his organization, foundation, he goes all over the world certifying or not certifying elections. Once I was in Georgia, uh, uh, actually we went to visit his foundation, and I got to ask him, I said, look, uh, it's very nice that you go all over the world, but I haven't seen you here in Miami where there is fraud every time there are elections. I haven't seen you in LA. I haven't seen you in New York. What is that? I mean, you will make from news indicating that in the South, for instance, every time there is fraud. And, uh, you know, they were like, well, you know, that's not our job. We, you know, we are overseas uh, institution. We can't work in the, and I'm like, well, you know, I know who you work for. 
So, uh, see, the thing is that we gotta let we gotta let these people that they can't hide it anymore. They can It's like minutes later that Evo Morales was forced to resign. We already knew. We already knew that uh, Marco Rubio, Ted Cruz, Bob Menendez, and uh, some other elements within the State Department were involved uh, with uh, uh, our asset, uh, the CIA asset in Latin America, who is Alvaro Uribe. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with that name. He's a former uh, Colombia, Colombian president. Uh, he's, the, he's, the, he's the power behind everything over there. Uh, Alvaro Uribe, Alvaro Uribe. Um, and, uh, and, and right now, Ivan Duque is the president, but everybody knows who is the real president. Like, remember here in the uh, 2000s, when you had a, a, a somebody by the name of George Bush, the president? But then he wasn't the power behind it. Then you have a vice president, and he was the one, right? He, 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 uh, he was the real um, uh, power there in the White House, uh, Dick Cheney. So uh, not to uh, uh, take all the time, because I see that my time is up almost. I just want to I just, I just leave you with this. Evo Morales, right now, right now, he is in a, in, a, in a city very close to Bolivia because he went back. Remember, Mexico saved him because he was going to be. See, what happened is that uh, the CIA wanted to do exactly the same like they did with uh, um, uh, Libyan uh, Qaddafi, Omar Qaddafi. Uh, uh, um, Qaddafi, the president? Yeah. Libya. Libya, and, and they wanted to do the same thing also uh, with Saddam Hussein, where they will show that the people will, will get him and humiliate him in the street and kill him. So that in the images, it's like he died like a worse than an animal. They wanted to do that with Evo Morales, but it was incredible how quick and fast they acted. Uh, meaning it was uh, closest advisors and they phoned directly to Mexico and Mexico said, don't worry about it, we are gonna help you right now. And they immediately sent a plane. And the day after, hours later, he was able to make it to Mexico. And then the team, uh, they call it the extermination team, which uh, were some members of the Mossad, which, by the way, they are still there, uh, so killing a lot of people. So they were, they failed. And it was a big problem for them because that was exactly the mission that they had. They were ordered not to let Evo Morales be alive. And they wanted to do it the same way that they did it uh, with uh, Libyan's president and, and Iraq's president. So they failed. So he went to Mexico, I was telling you, and uh, Mexico, he had a great time. You know, he was received as hero. And uh, he went to the uh, 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 universities, he went to uh, labor union, he went all over, uh, you know, talking to people and everything. So days later, uh, and, and you know now that Argentina has a new government. And uh, hopefully it's not the, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, Macri was there for four years. So Macri, basically what he did is completely give Argentina to the IMF, to the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, to the extent that uh, just in those four years, Macri put Argentina deep into over $100 billion in debt with the IMF because they know they knew he was going to lose. So what they did is, okay, look, let's do this quick because the Kurdish are coming, the Fernandes are coming. And that's uh, the new, uh, you know, many people agree that it's a center to the left uh, uh, political party. So now they are there. 
And that's why Evo Morales was able to go to Argentina. Because the new government actually say, look, we are very happy to have you here. As a matter of fact, he's been given uh, the status of political refugee. And, uh, and, and, and of course, now, and this is now going back to uh, what I told you about last Saturday. Last Saturday, the MAS had the National Assembly. And this is to um, the elections that are coming. Uh, the date is still, they are saying January or February, so still is, is um, in dispute. It, uh, it's not clear yet, but it's going to be very soon. So, but what happened at that, at that assembly, it, it was something uh, that you probably are not going to see anywhere in, in no other country. Thousands of thousands of Bolivians came from all over the country. And, and you, have, you have people who actually, you know, uh, uh, were walking. Those, uh, somebody was telling me 500 kilometers. Can you imagine? They came in to the city called Cochabamba. And in Cochabamba, they had the, uh, the numbers were between 10 to 15,000 uh, members uh, that were there to uh, come up with uh, their strategy for what they are going to do within the next few days, actually, or a few weeks for the elections. So guess what happened? They voted uh, unanimously uh, that Evo Morales was going to be their campaign manager. So. It's something that I've never seen before. You have a president who is not in the country, who was given a, a, a coup, the tie, and, 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 and almost killed. So now he went, back, he went to Mexico, and then he went to Cuba, and then he went to Argentina, where he's right now. And then now his party uh, uh, voted him to be the campaign uh, uh, manager. And you know what uh, the sense we are getting? Uh, and then, uh, you know, I, I'll stop here. Uh, the sense that you, you're getting now is that out of this whole nightmare, it looks like in the next elections, Evo Morales' uh, uh, party, to many people, it's, gonna, it's unquestionable that they will win. But a lot of people are saying that it's going to be a big win, even bigger than the one that just happened in October. So, and why is that? Because now, and this morning I got a, I got a couple of uh, audios too that um, um, there is a scandal right now in the in the in the ultra right uh, uh, members. They are fighting uh, over who is going to be the president. <laughs> they are fighting, and and now it's public. Venezuela. Exactly, exactly. And uh, if you go back to uh, uh, 1989, remember those elections? Uh, we were like, oh my God, what happened when uh, 1990 you got Violeta. Barrio de Chamorro elected president in uh, Nicaragua um, as a result of something that the State Department put together in Miami and put it together in the last minutes and they say to the ultra right wing guys, hey, let's get together and let's go over there. And suddenly they won the elections in 1989. So right now what is happening in Bolivia is like there's an infighting as you have never seen it. And to the extent that these two guys who were like, oh my God, yeah, they will, they will lead the opposition. So now because of this scandal, it looks like they're out of the picture. And then that leaves the ultra right wing element in a, in a, in a total state of despair. And, uh, and nationally, uh, if uh, the difference in the last elections was 10 points between Evo Morales and Carlos Mesa, the opposition guy, this time they are talking about 
at least 20. So I will uh, suggest uh, to you uh, to uh, keep, uh, keep an eye on it because this is going to send a message not just to the Bolivian people, not just to the uh, region, not just to the Western Hemisphere, uh, but, but I think to the whole continent and to the whole world. It's like, like right now you see it, uh, uh, Sebastián Piñera, the uh, Chilean uh, uh, president, is against the wall. He's right now, and, 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 and I think you are following everything, but just to give you a little detail, that, that right now the numbers that he had ordered to kill of Chileans is increasing. And, uh, and I heard something that uh, even there are some prisons that don't have more space for the uh, uh, political prisoners. So it's so the pressure, so much the pressure that uh, the constitution is going to be rewritten. And you don't do that uh, uh, unless there is a revolution. So what is happening right now, and this is the, my, my take on this, what is happening right now is that the neoliberal model, as you and I know it, has arrived at its end. The neoliberal economic model in Latin America is ended. So what does that mean? Yes, exactly. What does that mean now? Well, Colombia, for instance, the uh, center left in, uh, political parties in the last elections, just recent elections, not presidential, but provinces, state, and everything. They won. They won the elections. Uh, Ecuadorian president right now is getting into the situation in which he can't control the people. And then, uh, of course, uh, uh, MAS is going to come back to Bolivia. And then you have... Uh, um, uh, Peru, and then uh, you have the other countries in which people are really, really now organized and have gotten into a situation in which they say a new country, a new world, not only is possible, but it's necessary. So I think I... Uh, there are there is more to it, and uh, if I, if we have more time, I would be happy to to develop more. But I don't know how we are doing with the uh, with the time. Yeah, okay. Yeah. About Bolivia. Yeah. Bolivia. Uh, two questions. Mm -hmm. One is uh, starting with the elections. How certain are you that the elections are going to be fair, mm -hmm. and will they allow it? Number one. Number two, we have seen in the past, like in Chile in 1973, uh, we have seen it in Venezuela, what these people can do. And I have seen it in Venezuela myself that uh, there is a militia and that they are on the street. And just two days ago, a news came in that uh, they were about, like last year, 2 million. Now there are 3.3 million uh, militia that is protecting the revolution. And every single one of them is going to get a rifle or gun, something to defend themselves. So knowing these, why wasn't something similar to this? in effect in Bolivia, and would that have prevented Eva Morales to be deposed? I'm glad you raised that question, because you know what, uh, the vice president, uh, uh, Evo Morales vice president, touched on that. Because, uh, I mean, this is, uh, uh, this is your last part, right? But you're going back to the, the first part of, the, of uh, elections, are they going to be fair or not? Uh, MAS, the uh, Evo's uh, movement, Evo's political party, has a presence, a strong presence, in what is called uh, El Tribunal Electoral, the, the electoral uh, institution, uh, that there will be for probably, you know, there, 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 there might, there will be, I would say not to the extent to switch the result if MAS win. Uh, uh, Nicolás Maduro's uh, options are not that many. Um, and and uh, 
also one of the uh, what you are touching upon is very important because uh, I was in a discussion you know when I was there uh, with some people there and they were talking about uh, North Korea and uh, saying well you know uh, North Korea right why the why North Korea is standing tall and why, uh, you know, still there after, you know, as, as you remember, uh, 1950, 51, 52, 53, the U.S. bombed that part of the world and dropped more bombs in North Korea than the whole bombs that were dropped during World War II. 90% of that country was destroyed to the ashes. So what they did, hey, let's go nuclear. And... They got their uh, nuclear power. So Venezuela had been saying for some time, well, look, either we defend our country or it's going to happen what they did it to Saddam Hussein, what they did it to uh, Libya, what they are doing it right now to Syria. So... And actually, you, uh, you were saying about, uh, you know, two-something million, but you know what? The numbers uh, yesterday, I, I, I got some messages. They are looking, 2020, get a militia of over four million. And I can tell you that right now, even right now, right now, uh, when uh, I had a chance to go to some places, you, can, you see the highly organized... Uh, the militias are already there. And uh, it's like by blocks, by blocks, because they know, they say the Yankees are coming. They might be able to get in, but they will not get out. <laughs> they will not get out. And they say, and if they get out, we'll be in plastic bags. Now, knowing that, the U.S., even now, my Pompeo, I don't know if you heard his uh, latest words on, on Venezuela. He's like, no, we're not going to go there militarily. We're not going to go there. So what is happening right now, and, uh, and I was in, uh, you know, there is, there is a, a, a border uh, a point there called uh, Cucuta. Cucuta next to uh, part of uh, Venezuela. And you can see that what they are doing right now is organizing paramilitary mercenaries. Mm -hmm. They are bringing, and I found this out, uh, through actually one, uh, there, there is one who, has, uh, who got in just to get some information. And they are bringing uh, uh, mercenaries from uh, the Middle East. Yes. Middle East, I think... Uh, so you know that. They are uh, mercenaries from uh, uh, Honduras, El Salvador, uh, um, Colombia, of course, Peru. So they are already in the border. They're there. And some of them have already uh, uh, um, got in uh, Venezuelan territory. But as, as you mentioned, right now, the, w the way how uh, the Venezuelan government is dealing with this is like, look, Come in, we're waiting for you. Venezuela, it will never go back to your hands. And uh, to be honest uh, with you, from what I have seen, I think that the people in Venezuela, a large number, a, a big number, are just willing to defend their country, even if it's with their own lives. I saw, like, elderly people with... Uh, you know, I'm 16 and, uh, and, uh, and uh, assault rifles, and they get trained every morning. Every morning, they come in, uh, in a little, you know, space in their blocks to do the little exercise. Armed. And this is throughout the whole country. This, so this is Venezuela. This is in Venezuela. Yeah, because he was Bolivia. because why didn't uh, Bolivia have a similar and, and, and I'm going back to uh, uh, what the vice president. You know, uh, he recognized. He recognized uh, because somebody say, why knowing that the United States had even really attempt several times 
to kill Evo Morales, to do a coup d'etat, and, and why you didn't arm yourself? And uh, his answer was that, well, you know, that was, we, we have an armed forces, we have our own army, and, and by the way, 2008, you probably remember, 2008, uh, there was a, a, actually a military uprising uh, against Evo Morales in that part of, uh, you know, what is called Santa Cruz, where uh, all the right-wing elements are concentrated, and actually we have some uh, uh, military presence there, uh, undercover, and we train the mercenaries. So that area uh, is always... When you say we... It's not we. <laughs> well, I'm glad that you say that you know why. You know why? Everybody the US, here. The U.S. No. Everybody here, we pay taxes. Yeah. Yeah. These mercenaries. The C Do you know that the CIA is a public institution? Mm -hmm. It's a government institution. It's a what? It's a government institution. Okay. The CIA. We right. give six, about $500 million, billion dollars a year. Your money, my money. That's why I say we. The 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 uh, remember the Dulles brothers in Guatemala, right? With a couple of our banks, so they went over there because of United Fruit Company <laughs> to defend America, right? United Fruit Company and Guatemala to this day had not recovered. Had not recovered from that. More than four hundred thousand Guatemalans were were killed from 1954 all the way through the uh, peace accords in the 90s. So just to uh, close with this, because uh, I think that the question is, is, uh, is one that really, really, and now uh, they, they are looking into, because you know, what, you, know, you know what happened? Six officers who were involved on this document where they ask they suggest to Evo Morales to resign. Six of those officers were uh, from the School of Americas. Mm -hmm. And the one who came in and told to his face, hey, we suggest you resign, he had just been a military attaché in Washington from 2014 to 2018. Mm -hmm. So, now you say, wait a minute, Evo, come on. Didn't you feel it? You were surrounded by the CIA. So why you didn't have your own? And that's what they say, well, you know, we, you know, we were uh, working on developing the country. We were working on uh, bringing uh, food to the table for our Bolivians because you have to realize that Bolivia, and you know that, uh, for what, more than 200 years? ever since its foundation, poorest in the Western Hemisphere. And by the way, you know uh, who was the first president of Bolivia? Uh-oh, I'm testing you. <laughs> <laughs> That's why Bolivia is called Bolivia. Simón Bolívar. Bolívar. Imagine, imagine. So, so that's why Evo Morales, when he was in Mexico, and people say, oh my God, Evo, so wow, you land, you left, and so what's gonna happen? And he say, no, I'm coming back. And I'm going to come back with millions more. Because the history of Bolivia is, uh, is one of the most amazing histories of uh, any, any people. So